Oh. Sorry, that was do I need to do anything with that? She it got it. Okay, cool. So that's, uh, that's the cabbage is a butterfly. It's not a moth. It is. It is a butterfly. All right. And what other ways? You, you've been calling them cabbage moths? Huh? You've been calling them cabbage moths? Yeah, I was, I was, is it, do you know, is there a, a, a moth uh, that, that we would yes. call cabbage moths? Yeah, there are actually several. Okay, so there may be. Yeah, I know, sorry. Okay. Yeah. No problem, I got it. <laughs> so, so one of the ways you can tell moths from, but anybody know one way you can tell a moth from a butterfly? Is anybody besides Rick okay. behind you? Yeah, the antenna I would have clubs or hooks in the case of many of the skippers. Um, yes, yeah. So most moths rest with their wings spread and most butterflies rest with the wings like this. Um, I was really impressed with the car blue picture you had with the butterfly posed with the wings open. It's really hard shot to get. Although I, uh, the Carter, does that do it more often than that, uh, than some of the other butterflies do? Yeah. So I haven't been witness to Carter's as anyways near as much as Heidi has. Um, so uh, uh, the mustard white uh, laurel food host uh, plant would be those in the mustard family uh, with the, those dark main lines. The sulfurs um, are. Uh, there's, we've got a few different sulfurs in, in our region, uh, the pink edge sulfur uh, and the orange sulfur. Um, I don't have pictures of either of those, but they all have pink edges. One of the things that uh, we impress upon uh, newer counters on our count is if you see a sulfur with a pink edge around the ring, and I apologize, I don't know if we've got a good photo showing that, but they all to varying degrees have a pink edge around, um, the, ed around the edge of the wing. Um, so yeah, they can be confusing and a challenge to, to folks that are new to this. Actually, they can be a challenge to folks that aren't so new to it. Uh, so uh, we're moving on to the third family, the Lysinidae, um, otherwise known as the gossamer wing butterflies. Uh, the American copper, uh, these are very tiny. You know, we're probably talking about the wings folded, maybe an inch at the most. Um, and you can see from the, the picture of the pine elephant here with the, uh, with the perspective of being on somebody's pointer finger, that they're real, the elephants are really, really tiny. Uh, we don't see these at all on any of the, the formal counts that are being done for the North American Butterfly Association, because these are out very early and are gone very early. They don't fly. Uh, they're single brooded and they don't fly for the whole season. Uh, and the harvester is also a, a small butterfly. Um, what's interesting about it, it is the only um, carnivorous, I, I hesitate to say, Butterfly. So when we're talking butterfly, we're really talking about a, a four-stage creature, right? Egg, uh, larvae, chrys chrysalis, and the adult butterfly. The caterpillar for this butterfly uh, feasts on aphids. So it's the only. Um, I'm not, does anybody know? Do you guys know? Is there a, a carnivorous species anywhere else on the planet? I think it's the only one on in, on that's carnivorous, at least in, in North America. So these are, they're, they're actually pretty exciting find. They're not particularly common. Can I skip one? Okay. Um, the, uh, the hair streaks uh, are dainty kind of jewels when you find these. They're really interesting to find. When you look at them, uh, they, they present a different profile, more of an angular profile. The wingtips are uh, 
when you look at the apex of the, the forewing there, it comes to a pretty sharp angle. Uh, we've got a, these are three of the more common ones you see around here. There's a couple other species, the Acadian and the striped, uh, the Edwards, if you're going down to the Pine Barrens where the car blues are, uh, you'd see those as well. And uh, so all these gossamer wing butterflies in the family of Cindy there are, are quite tiny. Um, on the left there is the eastern tail blue. And if you look kind of closely at the hind wing in the back, you see these little project projections or tails. Uh, they are not always there though. They're pretty delicate and often uh, fall off with time. And the center one there is a silvery blue is um, pretty distinctive from the, the tail blue. It does not have a tail. And if you notice those markings on the hind wing, those sort of black circles with a white border are very distinctive. Um, and the, the, what I'm calling the summer Asia, you can, if you look at the, in the Kaufman's guide, uh, they're, I think it's called the spring Asia complex. Um, but that's not the latest word on it. Uh, for those of you that are interested, I recommend an, a, 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 an article you can find on the web called Taming the Blues by Brian Pfeiffer. Has anybody ever seen that one before? Yeah, it's, it's pretty good uh, description of the fact that this causes this, 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 what they call Asia complex causes a lot of consternation amongst people that are into this because it's, it's not really set, the science isn't necessarily settled on um, how many species are involved. Okay, uh, these are, uh, the, the fritillaries are pretty ubiquitous. How many have never seen a, a, a butterfly um, that looks something like this? Probably most of you have. Uh, I mean, if you've got Joe Pieweed or uh, any of the goldenrod species, these, these tend to, to, to swarm. Uh, the great spangled is the largest of the three, but uh, a largest of the greater fritillaries. We have three of them. We've got the great spangled. These are the larger fritillaries, the ones with, you know, roughly three, three and a half inch wingspans. Uh, the, so the, the larger ones are the great spangled, the Atlantis, and the Aphrodite, which, or Aphrodite, uh, which I don't have a picture of here. And then the, the two lesser fritillaries that you'd see around here would be the meadow and the, the silver border uh, fritillary. How am I doing for time, by the way? We're, we're, we're good? Um, okay. Uh, so, oh, I, what I didn't mention the last slide, we're in a new family. We're in the uh, Nymphalidae, uh, otherwise known as the brushfoots. So if you hold a butterfly, uh, by its wingtips and just let the, the, the legs dangle from below. Uh, butterflies like all insects have how many legs? Six. Six. Uh, but if you hold one of the brush foots up, it's going to look, unless you look really closely, like it only has four. So the four legs are, are kind of held up against the thorax like this, and they've got hairs on them, and they're said to look like brushes, hence the name uh, brushfoots. So the brushfoot started with the prior slide of fritillaries. So for a ways here, this is the largest family. Um, I don't think just around here, I think maybe worldwide it's the largest family of butterflies. Um, something on order of 6,000 plus species worldwide. And uh, so the first one we have up here is called the pearl crescent. I would say uh, the, the, as the Asia complex causes a lot of consternation from amongst people trying to identify butterflies, the Pearl and Northern Crescent look very much alike. Um, and sometimes I scratch my head wondering why they decide to make 
two species out of them because they really are difficult to discern. The Baltimore checker spot, um, my personal favorite, I know it's subjective, uh, but I always get excited finding one of these here, as you can see, quite beautiful. Just uh, uh, one note here, the, the, these right to photographs, as well as some of the others in my presentation were taken by uh, a photographer named Mike Thomas. And if you, uh, if, if you have some time, look him up online. His website is natureupclose.com. And he takes some stunning photographs, not just butterflies, but insects in general. Uh, tiger beetles is one of his specialties. He's got a lot of beautiful photos of, of tiger beetles. And the Harris checker spot. So if you look there, you can see uh, why they're called checker spots, but you can see they're, they're a little different, right? Um, let's see. There's also a silvery checker spot, which I, uh, there's not been a recorded one in Carroll County on iNaturalist. Um, and I think most of the sites have been in the southern part of the state. Oh, wait a minute, no, no, I'm sorry. The silver checker spot, I don't think there's ever been an observation uh, in the state of New Hampshire. I think they're all in, in Maine. Um, so one would, one would think they might be around, it's just nobody has found them. All right, so there's a bunch of butterflies called the angle wings, called that because there's lots, if you look closely at these wings, there's lots of angles. They don't, the, the, the trailing edge of the wing is, or the outer margin of the wing is not smooth like you find on, on most, most butterflies. Uh, funny story about the check, uh, the, the question mark is uh, my wife, was helping out on one of the counts years ago. And um, she, was, she was helping out. She was the one that was tallying the count on the count form. And I said to her, put that down as a question mark. And she said, oh, you don't know what it is? I said, no, no, it's a question mark. Um, you, yeah, but do you want to figure it out later? No, it's a, it's a, it's a question mark for the species. It, and it, this went on for quite a while until I, I actually had to open the guidebook and show her, see, there's <laughs> the question. It's actually, uh, the species name is actually called the question. Um, and uh, this, this little thing here, let me see, can I get rid of this? Uh, will this move? Ah, there we go. So, if, if you look right here, there's a silver mark that looks kind of a little bit like a comma with a dot underneath it. That's what's giving this its name. It said, that's said to look like a question mark. So the Eastern comma, the one, the second one from the left looks very similar to it. Underneath um, this dot, oh, This, the, the, this, this dot that's to the left of the comma would not be present on an Eastern comma. Uh, we also have a lesser common green comma and a gray comma. I don't have pictures of those. Um, and then we've got this group of, uh, these couple of butterflies known as tortoiseshells, one of Milbert's tortoiseshell and a Compton's tortoiseshell. So the morning cloak, again, continuing with this large family in Nymphalidae. Um, how many of you have seen morning cloaks? Okay, everyone. Um, morning cloaks are, at least around here, are the considered to be the Methuselah of butterflies. They overwinter as adults. You can believe that and survive New Hampshire winters as adults. Uh, some of them live nine, 10 months long. One of the world's oldest living butterflies. The uh, Red Admiral, um, 
Heidi, I actually think I took that picture at the Harris Center. Remember that day we caught one there? Yeah. Um, this is a, a, an interesting butterfly. It's, it's claim to fame is that it's perhaps the most pugnacious of butterflies. I've actually been attacked by a red admiral. Really, I was on top of Black Mountain over in uh, Haverhill Benton area, uh, Western National Forest. Um, and uh, this was probably male that was hilltopping. It was near the summit of the mountain and it just kept darting at me. Now it's hard to imagine a creature with less onboard defenses than a butterfly. I mean, they have nothing <laughs> as far as onboard armaments to, uh, to hurt you in any way. So it was pretty impressive to see something like this attacking me. Um, so the, the red spotted purple and the white admiral, what's interesting is these are actually technically, look at how different they look in coloring. They're technically the same species. All right, the, the red spotted purple is the more Southern form and the white admiral is the more Northern form, but we actually live in an area uh, where there are integrates. We're kind of like where the, where the territories for these two butterflies overlap. And I have seen intermediate forms where one, where they look kind of confused. They're, some of them, uh, you know, you might see a red spotted purple with some semblance of a white part of a white stripe like you see on the white hat. And up top is the, move this out of the way, is an American lady. Uh, I, I think you can make an argument. This is the most beautiful of the butterflies we see around here. It and, and, and the other Vanessa species called the painted lady. There's a, another butterfly that looks very close to this, except instead of the two eye spots that you see on the American lady, you'd see four eye spots on the, on the high wing. These, these one and two here, you see actually four. phone keeps falling asleep on me here. All right. So I asked the question, what species of butterfly is this? Who can tell me? Yes. Viceroy. Viceroy. Excellent. And why do you say it's a viceroy? That line. Right. Yeah. So this line that you see, and you can see it both in the, the ventral view here and in the dorsal view here is what distinguishes it as a viceroy. And it's also noticeably smaller. If you hold these in hand, you can see that the Viceroy is smaller. And also in flight, um, they do tend to have distinctively different flight patterns. The monarch is more of a, you know, a, a flop, flop, glide. Uh, whereas this, uh, this has a more of a constant wing beat. Um, but this is also very closely related to the red spotted purple and the white admiral. They're all of the same, the, the uh, Lemenitis genus. Uh, and this is uh, a, a number of butterfly species. This happens to be, uh, I'm told there's a way to just to, to tell whether this is a a, uh, a red spotted purple, white admiral, or a viceroy. It's, it's a Lamenitis uh, lim or limonitis um, caterpillar. And its strategy for survival is to look like a bird dropping. Um, some of the swallowtails um, employ the same strategy. The, the giant swallowtail, in particular, is caterpillar is really cool because it'll. It looks like a bird dropping, and if you actually threaten it in some way, it'll stick out these antennae. They look like they're orange. They look like a snake tongue. Um, but you can see here, here in this picture, they can be in the first stage or what is called an instar. They can be very tiny, and eventually they get quite a bit larger. And this is, I'm sure, the, the last or fifth instar here. And monarchs, um, I won't hand these out if I had a larger crowd. 
So do, if you have a dime in your pocket, pull it out and consider how much it weighs. Well, here, let me just, let me hand out a few things. Okay, so how many of uh, how many dimes do you think it would take to equate the weight of your average monarch butterfly? Anybody want to guess? Somebody give me. I'd guess it would be less than one. Less than one? You'd guess that a monarch weighs less than one. All right. Well, good. That, that, that's it. You guys are smart. <laughs> so you're at, so a dime weighs 2.268 grams. We'll round it to 2.27. Your average monarch weighs about a half a gram. So consider the fact, for, consider the fact that this creature that weighs roughly half an ounce flies all the way from New Hampshire and as far north as the Maritimes. So from New Hampshire to, to Mexico, to the Oyamel fir forests, the high, high elevation forests of Mexico is roughly 2,400 miles as the crow flies. So this tiny creature that weighs that much is it, it's pretty remarkable that it's able to fly all the way to Mexico. And if you hold one of these in your hand and you've held other butterflies, you, you're immediately aware of how this creature is adapted to survive that journey. It's a rugged butterfly. It almost sounds like an oxymoron, but it, there really are strong and you can really feel when you, when, you put, when you put your fingers over the vein lines, they're very rigid. Um, so I, 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 I just, if you participate in one of these counts, you may have the opportunity to hold one in your hand and experience that. Um, so this is just showing the stages. This, this is a butterfly that I raised um, this, this past summer. Uh, and uh, it's just, Pretty, pretty uh, remarkable kind of miraculous thing to experience. I mean, I get asked about whether it would be helpful to raise butterflies, but would you be helping out the monarchs? Perhaps some of you have read that uh, they've done studies and, and monarchs reared in captivity like this are, are generally thought to not be as strong and that you, know, you, know, you may be impacting uh, negatively the gene pool by, by raising them this way. Personally, I think if you're going to raise just one or two, it's not a big deal. If we were to be doing this in mass, it probably would. Uh, if you've got children or grandchildren, I would say this is, this would be a great thing to do with kids. Oh, and one other thing about monarchs, what do monarchs feed on? Milkweed. Milkweed. So uh, there, are, there are, I think there's 10 Asclepius, milkweeds in the genus, genus Asclepius. There's 10 Asclepius species that, are, that grow in some part of New England. Um, common milkweed is the one we see out growing in the wild here most often. But if you're looking to plant some on your own, there's uh, butterfly weed, uh, there's swamp milkweed, um, there's world milkweed. So there's a bunch of different species, but you want to make sure um, that they're in the genus Asclepius and they'll, they'll so they feed them. All they do, okay. yeah, as far as I know, yeah. So if you get any milkweed, that's good. Yeah, if you get, you know, incarnata or syriaca or tuberosa, they'll, they'll feed on it. Yeah. And uh, oh, continue again with the Nymphalidae, the, the, the browns. Uh, Littlewood satyr is pretty distinctive, as is the common wood nymph. 
Um, these are butterflies you see, you know, often in in the ecotone or in the woods. Um, they're not, they don't visit flowers, uh, tree sap, um, sometimes scat. This, uh, the eye brown um, can be a tough ID. They can look, they can often look a lot like the pearly eye. And there's also an Appalachian brown uh, that's been spotted in this county. I think there's been four sightings on iNaturalist of the Appalachian brown. And the, old, the lower right is the common ringlet, ringlet. The taxonomy on this appears to be changing. Uh, if you go on iNaturalist, you'll see some of these identified as inornate ringlets. Um, Ceonympha California now, I think is the actual um, species name for them. Uh, but I don't know if the science is settled on it because they're, 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 iNaturalist is, it seems to be set, accepting both uh, either the common ringlet or the uh, internate ringlet identification. And the skippers. Um, I won't, uh, we won't get into any great depth on these here. There's uh, 22 to 20, well, I think if you go across the state, there's probably 30 plus of these. Uh, in my region, um, I've got 22 of them on the count form. Um, in the southern part of the state, there's more. And these can be um, a thorn in, in anyone's side trying to, to make species identifications. They can be really quite difficult. The, the one on the right, the wild indigo, uh, dusky wing. I am thankful that my count is in July and that the juveniles and dreamy are are no longer flying at that time because <laughs> in the field I I probably do uh, you know humming humming I don't know what this is uh, for sure um, and and take a good picture and kind of go back and study it under under really good light um, so there are a lot of these they're kind of like the confusing fall warblers if you're a birder. Um, but uh, I think as Rick and I both are discovering, they can be kind of fun once the challenge is gone of taking, of, of IDing the, uh, the larger butterflies that are more easily, easy, easily discerned. And a lot of folks probably weren't even aware that some of these are butterflies. They have stouter bodies, so they, they might have thought that they were moths. But again, the, the antennae and with, with the with the uh, the skippers they have the the, the hooked antennae. Um, I've, I I brought uh, just a quick introduction to the count form. Uh, you're welcome to come up and pick one of these up afterwards. Uh, this is a count form that uh, I uh, continually update based on. Uh, what we're seeing in the area, I just added the giant swallowtail to this list. Uh, you might find it handy. How many of you have field guides to butterflies? Pretty much everyone. Um, uh, just a word about how many have the Kaufman's guide? Anybody have the Swift guide? What about uh, uh, butterflies through binoculars? I know Heidi has that one. Yeah. Um, I would say if you don't have a butterfly guide, that if that, that the Kaufman or the Swifts, uh, a butterfly is good. The Kaufman tends to be less intimidating, but if you're a detailed guy and uh, a detailed person, that uh, the Swift guide is. I really, I I use the Swift guide. Probably if I got that when it was first getting started, I would have been pretty intimidated by it. So Rick was just holding up either one of those. Um, there's also an Audubon guide, which I do not like. Uh, if you look online, if you Google best field guides to butterflies, the Audubon guide is often mentioned as a really good guide. Um, it's, it's outdated. 
it was copywritten, I think, in 80 or 81. So it's not, it doesn't even mention uh, the Canadian tiger swallow tail, for example. Um, and I don't like the, the plates separated out from the text. So you have to go to one place for the picture and another place for the description. Not a big fan of that. Um, so what I, what, the reason I put this trifolded count form together, uh, we all would love to have a field guide, right? That just focuses on the species in our area. Uh, that doesn't exist. Um, but what's nice about this is this gives us just the species that we have to focus on as, in this area. And uh, let me just skip ahead here. Um, so if you look on this sheet here, you've got uh, two numbers here. These are the page numbers for the field guides. The top one is the Kaufman page number. And the bottom one is a swift page number. So I never look at the indexes in the field guides anymore. I just use this. And I've used this form enough. Uh, and my hope is that others will as well, that I I can, with my eyes closed, I can put my finger on, on a species and get to the page in the field guide really quick. And that's the intent to use this in the field to be able to go to the picture, go to right to the page in the field guide. Uh, this also gives you um, an abundance indicator. So it's, if it's an A, we're very likely to see it on the count. If it's an E, we've never seen it on the count. Um, and everything in between. And it gives you, you know, flight periods uh, when you're likely to see them. The count form, was designed to be used on the July butterfly count, uh, uh, the one I organized. But the intent is for the form to, is for the form to cover all the species that you'd see throughout the year in your region. So uh, you see up up here we've got elfins. We would never see elfins in July in New Hampshire anywhere. Um, and that's part of why the abundance code is E or. Mm -hmm. Correct, exactly. Right. Yes, that's correct. That's so uh, that, that will always remain E unless, well, in our lifetimes, let's hope so. I mean, I, I hope, hope that the climate doesn't change so much that we're seeing elephants in, in July. Um, so, yeah, um, I've, I've got a sense that, uh, um, let's see, 756. Let's move on here. So on the, on, the, on the front side of the form is all the larger species, all, uh, you know, all the species, the Papillonidae and the Pieridae and the Nymphalidae and Lysinidae. On the back is the skippers. And um, I've arranged the count forms so that um, the skippers are listed. This is somewhat subjective but listed in order by complexity of color and pattern. So the top five there are the ones that are, you know, the least intricately patterned, essentially plain, there's no spot bands. Um, and as you move down, uh, starting with the tawny edge skipper, which you could argue might be grouped with the plain ones, but they're sometimes has some, some pattern there. Um, but as you move down, you get increasingly more and more complex pattern skippers. Um, so uh, it's an attempt to, to, to make it easier. Um, and I'm showing down here in the middle here, there's these footnotes. So if you notice the butterflies have um, like the European skipper has a w one, and then that corresponds over here into the center panel of the, the count form to this footnote. Um, so it's just a tip on identifying the European skipper. So most of the species have a footnote associated with them. On the front of the form, where the larger non-skipper species are, um, Actually, I shouldn't say larger necessarily because some of the, the uh, gossamer wing butterflies are quite small. There's also numbers there 
And uh, if, for those of you that are interested, uh, the footnotes and those you know are, are printed on a, on a separate sheet. And um, so that's pretty much all I have to say other than um, going over quickly some of these things that you can do to help support butterflies. Uh, the first one is that we, we've already talked about. Most of you, it sounds like you've all got um, a field guide. So just getting out there, getting interested, posting your observations. How many of you are active users of iNaturalist? Okay, good. Yeah, are you liking it? Yeah, and it's, it, it's, it's so easy to use. It's pretty fantastic that you can see right down to the town you live in, what's being observed in your area and pull it up on a map and zoom in and see, um, and you know, some, you don't always have to expose for rare species. It's probably a good idea not to expose it precisely where you found it, um, but you can see what's in your area. Plant more native plant species. Um, I brought a list with me for those of you that are interested, I'll, I'll happily give it to you that I've put together of, of native plant species that you can plant in your yard to attract uh, you know, butterflies, both larval plant hosts as larval plant hosts and as uh, food sources. Um, and don't always, uh, you know, be fooled by, by what a garden center is going to try to sell you. I don't know how, uh, most of you probably know what butterfly bush is. Budelia, Davidy, how do you pronounce that right? Is that, do I get that? Budelia, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I've heard that there's actually, um, a, uh, they've developed a sterile form of it. Has anybody encountered that in their travels that they've, that one that, that is unable to produce uh, viable seeds, um, but they, it, it can be invasive. Uh, of course, skip the use of insecticides and pesticides for obvious reasons. Considered being part of uh, Tin Mountain's butterfly count uh, support organizations that promote butterfly conservation, butterfly and pollinator conservation, North American Butterfly Association, Journey North. Uh, there are uh, um, Xerxes Society. Um, if you got kids, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know of a kid that doesn't like butterflies. So they're, I would, if, if, if you have any exposure to kids, introduce them to butterflies. Um, and the other two are kind of obvious we talked about iNaturals. So that's all I have for you. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, Dexter. I wondered if, you would, if people were at all intimidated about you know being part of the count and I'll never be able to tell an Eastern from a Canadian. If, if you would say something about how they could be helpful anyway on account, even if they're not already. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah so um, I mean, that's where I started. You know, I, I came and said, geez, how can I be helpful? I think probably for the first couple of years, I was holding a clipboard with a count on it, and somebody was telling me what to put it down as. Um, and uh, so there's that. Um, if uh, I'm, I'm getting older. I still like to think I can chase down a fritillary, but I'm learning more and more that uh, it's becoming harder and harder. So if you have uh, the capacity to, to run down a butterfly with a net, that's a massively huge thing, way you can be helpful. You and may not necessarily, fun, right? what's that? And a lot of fun. And a lot of fun, yeah, yeah. So but you got net, you don't break so you net up. Uh, we, cer we, we certainly try not to, uh, but, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, along the way, we perhaps heard a few, but, you know, we try to, to capture and release unharmed. We'll sometimes even throw them in a cooler, uh, just to settle them down so we get a closer down. So, so I'm sensing I've taken way more to well, no, well, I'm, that's yeah. my, you're taking my job. Oh, okay. Well, I, I don't, don't want to take your job. job. I don't want to take your job. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Um,
Yeah, uh, I, I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague. Yeah, I, that, no, my job is to do what you just okay. asked. Okay. But yeah, let's get a round of applause. And Jeff, thank you. And you as well. Awesome. All right. So um, yeah, last little bit is the questions about logistics, right? What do we do from here? Now that we've got you all queued up and excited, oh my God, I can't wait. You know, and we're sitting here with snow and <laughs> shoveling. Um, we will be doing trainings before we actually get out of the field, right? And that's what Heidi was alluding to before. We actually have a schedule um, that includes a number of online trainings that you can attend that are taking place, not just here, but down at the Harris Center or over at, at, at Sunapee or at George's, you know, living room. I mean, we've got, we, we have all kinds of things that we can get even more excited and learn a little bit more before we get out in the field and stumble our way with a net. Um, there are, starting with the Zoom online trainings that Heidi has coordinated, we've got four dates and this will all be posted on the Tin Mountain website. It will be posted on the Fish and Game website, probably on the nature groupie website and my god you know if you just google how can i learn about butterflies in new hampshire you will find this i guarantee but february 22nd mark ellingwood is going to run through the first of four modules and this is just one example this is module two which has all kinds of butterflies labeled and described in here and he'll run through module one on February 22nd. On March 8th, George, our esteemed local naturalist from Wentworth will go through module two. And then on March 22nd, that was March 8th. And then March 22nd, Heidi's gonna do module three. And then finally on April 5th, yours truly will be doing module four. And, and by then, if you've, paid attention, all I'm gonna do is turn on the slide and ask you what the butterflies are that I'm showing. And you can put it on the chat. You'll have it down by then. Actually, there's some tough ones on module four. So that's the first four set. And then there are individual trainings as a part of the other groups around the state. So for example, on the 27th of April, uh, Butterfly Basics will be presented at the Harris Center with the Harris Center count organizers, Susie Spickle and Mark Ellingham. On Wednesday, April 19th, there'll be another introduction to New Hampshire butterflies that George DeWolf is going to offer, and that will be also online. Uh, Wednesday, May 17th, George is going to continue his series for the Wentworth count, but available to all of us uh, with is even more challenging groups, uh, not the hardest group that you have to get to on the last of his on June 4th, the confusing skippers. But we've got three different ones that George is doing. So that's just those, that set, the sort of four regional Zoom and then three that George is gonna operate and we'll be posting information about that on the website. Then there are in-person trainings you can do, whether you go to Keene or you go out to the Harris Center or whether you go out to Sunapee, go to Audubon and Concord, um, there's gonna be a ton. I mean, Heidi's done an awesome job, just proliferating training opportunities for you lepidopterists. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, what's a lepidopterist? That's you guys. You love lepidoptera. That's the order of butterflies. Lepido means scale, right? Scaly wings. And unlike moths, which is personal experience, way more insane than looking at butterflies, they actually hold on to those scales for a good length of time. So it's hard. It's actually kind of hard to find an old wizened butterfly, an old fritillary that's on its last legs and half chewed up 
without any markings on it. But in the moth world, that's a piece of cake. Half of them are that way. Anyway, butterflies are so much easier. 100 species, piece of cake. So we're going to have fun. And then last but not least, the four counts, right? That I, at least we have dates for. This is the July actual in the field with the nets. Whether you know what they are or not, we need your dexterity, Dexter, yes. with the net. So you can bring them in and then George and I will maybe identify them. Uh, July 8th is the Baker Pond count. That's the Wentworth Warren one that George is responsible for. On July 15th, we've got the Lake Sunapee count and the Great Bay count. Okay, two different counts. July 22nd is da, 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 Tin Mountain and the Super Sanctuary down in Hancock, if you happen to find your way down that way. And then last but not least, Heidi's Capital Area count on July 29th. These are all Saturdays in July. And then the rain date is the Sunday. And it's generally, I don't know, we used to meet at what, 30 ish or something? Or? Yeah, 3. I, I would be doing an ad effort. Yeah. If, if, you're, if you're going to commit to a count, commit to both days. A lot of people say, yeah. well, I'm just going to, if, if it's oh. sunny on Saturday, I would go, but I'm going to plan something else on Sunday. We really can't know until the Friday before the count. We generally don't pay which day yeah. we're going to pay. So it's even, really healthy from set. We've home. even had shown up on Saturday and we canceled it one time because right. the rains came in and we had to go come back on Sunday. So, um, and you know, and it gets tricky, right? If it's raining or if there's a lot of dew, the last thing you want to do is kill the bugs you're trying to protect, you know? So you don't want to net them with a bunch of moisture because then they get stuck to the side of the net and you got to peel them off and it, it's all over. So we have to have a good good flying day. Now that said, y'all photographers with the long lenses, we need you too. Because I started doing this, and I know this because we've been doing this with Carter Blues. Um, you know, why even capture them in a net if you can take a good picture, which counts. If you can identify it from the picture, it counts. We put it right on the data form, which is nice because NABA isn't like, you know, the old school, Audubon, you get a blow oil out of the sky and then confirm that it's, a, you know, a gray black back gull or whatever. So this is nice if you've got photography skills and you can come out with us. And we kind of tandem several people on our Baker count, you know, have pictures and show them. But it, it is nice to have it in hand. We do bring out Petri dishes. So we'll put them in the Petri, clear Petri dishes. And then we take pictures of them as well. I always take pictures in the Petri. So I've got a record myself of what I captured during the day. The count teams, usually there's one or two, maybe three people in a team. And this is our map right here. In a minute, we're gonna just adjourn and people can come up and take a look at the map. And for us here at Tin Mountain, what I'm looking to, to try and get is at least five different count teams of three people. That'd be a target. And we've had, my gosh, at Baker, we've had what, maybe 20 people sometimes? Oh, actually, if you include the campers. Oh yeah, that's 30 right, or more. 30 or more. But you know, it's nice to have a bunch of teams because we've got, you know, a 7.5 mile radius, 90, I calculated 0.5% of which is in the state of New Hampshire, so it counts. I was a little reticent to move the count circle to Tin Mountain because that means that about 40% would be in the White Mountain National Forest <laughs> without a bunch of roads and trails and stuff. So, so we we have we moved it to the count center in for Tin Mountain is downtown Conway, right at the Conway Library public library that's count dead you know ground zero and then seven and a half miles and um, well we can go scroll i've got a couple of maps here we're doing basically all of conway we've got the eastern part of albany we've got just a sm smidgen of a small little bit in chatham we don't quite reach jackson sorry Lori, nor quite don't quite but park bartlett we're just about right at your front yard is where the edge of the circle is, uh, Rick. So, so that's good. We've got Eaton and the north part of Madison. 
Okay, so that's pretty much the towns. So there's one West Side Road. Oh my gosh! And I've emailed our, our good partners, the Upper Saco Valley Land Trust, to get some permissions. I'll be working over that on that over the next few months. We get permissions from the landowners so we can come tromp through their hay fields before they mow them down. Hopefully, you know maybe they'll be uh, pollinator full in uh, on the 22nd of July uh, before they do their second mowing. That's the, that was one reason I was thinking, because up here, the first mowing will be done the third week of June, sometimes the last week of June, which means another three weeks, almost four, we should have some good flowering material to attract these pollinators before they come in and cut the hay the second time. And that, that's very purposeful. And also July, right, all four of these dates in July is trying to hit the bell curve at the peak in terms of species. Mm -hmm. And like George said, we could have as many as 50 species in a single day, which is awesome. Half of all the diversity in New Hampshire. Cool. All right, what am I missing? Questions? Yes, Logan. Yes, you can, but you have to be pretty darn certain on a visual record that that's what you, you know, for example, it's a monarch and you know the difference between that and a viceroy. Yeah, we're not gonna argue that point. And each of the teams will have their own data forms, these fantastic updated data forms that George did. So we can actually bring them into the field. And very often one of the three people will be doing the recording and then they switch off and grab the net and we got two netters and one record, you know, that kind of thing. And so, you know, if you, oh yeah, there's a monarch and, and you know, it's maybe a hundred yards away, you got your binox on it. And if you can get the binox away from the grasshopper sparrow, you're good. You get the monarch while it's flying by and then you can tally that up. Say, oh yeah, monarch, you know. And George and I have done that a lot. We, you know, we run through the, oh yeah, what'd you get? Oh, check your spot, okay. And I don't question, you know, cause something like that, you know, it's pretty obvious. But when it comes to skippers, oh, the fall warblers, the butterfly world, I know. They're like, how fast do you want the data? Because if I, if I took pictures and put them in uh, high naturalist, yep. it might take a couple of days to get, get the information back. Well, if you're coming with us on the count, okay, first and foremost, we'll get your data right on a data form, right? That's the first and foremost. But then after that, I didn't do. Wanna... I would say you don't even have to put them on that iNaturalist if they're part of this formal count. Yeah. Um, I know the Lake Summit team met like a week later or two weeks later once the photos got organized. And usually a photo might be like connects to butterfly unknown one, unknown two. And they sat together and kind of went through it and cleaned up the data. The actual count data has to be submitted by September 12th. Oh, okay. for a given year. Okay. So there's plenty of time to come together. Oh, they have lots of unknowns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just tracking them that day in the field and linking the two up on the form. Yeah, okay. you and us both. I mean, we'll all have that. And 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 actually, that's a beautiful nothing, Georgia, put in these unknown skipper types. We know it's this grass skipper. And it's a worthy piece. If we know it's a skipper, and we know it's a grass skipper, and it's one of that first group, you know, un, unmarked under wings. Well, great. We'll just check it off. We can't submit that as a definitive record, obviously, to NABA, but we've got something that we can then work on. And it gives us a sense, too, of how much, you know, uncertainty we've got in a given collection. And I would just say, you know, it's okay if you have to say skipper species for the first year or two, but we're getting really good counts on those that we can identify well. Between the two new counts last year, on both those days, we observed about 28 to 34 species that we confirmed between all of us. And we saw 401 count and 800 individuals in another count. And that was just a matter of timing. You know, yeah. a crescent flush came through one week and we saw hundreds of them. But it's good. Let's just get going mm -hmm. and we will yeah. improve together over time. Yeah, because we got years, right? Yes. I mean, we, this is a long term project. Jesus, when we did the dragonfly count, we had five years. So consider that. Uh, is it just butterfly? Do you find water? 
And that's uh, and that's also a good thing to do when you, you know, the skies are dry. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't start beating the bushes for caterpillars, but not the flying. It's either rainy or too windy or the sun. Or the yeah, I, I'd also add. Is it rare? Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you're handy with a camera. You you have some skill. Or, <laughs> Are you well, you're taking, okay. you're taking pictures. Yeah, so you send me some real pictures. I'm going to use that. Well, we're really, really, I, mean, I think, and probably as part of the statewide effort, I mean, just anybody that's handling the camera, very valuable resource. And on, on, honestly, uh, when I first got involved with the count, we always discourage people from bringing cameras because, you know, we really want you to be focused on focusing on getting and capturing. But with camera technology, you, 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 it's just as valuable, if not more valuable, than a photo. Yeah. So I think we want to encourage more and more people to take the pictures. They don't have to put an eye actress or anything. Most of the, most of the pictures have the date in the exit. That's what I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. But George, you're not you're not giving them the, the real the real reason is because we're not as fast as we used to be. Right, yeah, and yeah. The picture, we can get, but yeah. when we approach that coral hair tree, it's going to go way faster. Well, yeah, that's what I was So we're just going to try to get it for And I would think that someone with a camera can point in with the intent of, like, I'm just trying to capture it for ID purposes versus the perfect picture. Yeah, There's right. Oh, no. There's a whole yeah. 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 So, ID So, and Jen, Jen, yeah. and all Okay. Yeah, Good. Well, the, well, the only other thing yeah, here is, it, it, and I tell this is what I'm saying right now. If it is a D or an E, we want a, a, yeah. an abundance indicator. Oh, yeah. We want. Oh, yeah. 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 We, we, we're not going to trust that if you see variegated fritillary, we're not going to trust it with you. And yeah. I have a juvenile test. We're not going to trust it. Yeah. 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 I mean, everybody. Oh, right. See, now I want a picture. I yeah, got a uh, picture of it. I looked it out of yes. my record. So yes. we'll get some calls. Okay. One last thing I would add to that. You know, one of the hurdles to us even starting to promote this and to be able to offer training was to put together slides of photos yeah. that had the rights to use. You know? yeah. and there was a woman in Lake Summit region, Amy Highstrom, who put together yeah. some of these original modules from photos she took and she said, here, have them. And so if there are a few, we have a list between all of us. There's a few rare ones we haven't gotten yet. And anyone who's willing to help us add to our training material, that, that's really helpful as well. This is a turtle. I would personally buy you dinner if you get a picture of a Henry oh. Shaw Street. Oh, well, Steve Barry. Yeah, I like Steve Barry. You know, he's amazing. That's a truly marvel. All right, any other questions? Because otherwise, we're done. Good. All right, thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Oh, oh, thank you. We would break me, but it's always good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.